Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 139, Pick Your Parade. And the following is a sermon that I preached last year's Palm Sunday. And our readings were from Mark chapter 11 and Mark chapter 15. And in the liturgical calendar, we have two parts of our service on Palm Sunday. We have the Liturgy of the Palms and the Liturgy of the Passion. And so we read the palm narrative from Mark chapter 11, which has Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And then we also talk about the Passion narrative and Jesus's interaction with Pilate and Pilate's offer to release a prisoner to the Jews of their choosing. Who does he want them to have released, Barabbas or Jesus? And in the sermon that I preached, um, which I'm presenting to you this week in lieu of this year's Palm Sunday and Holy Week, a week that I find very busy in my own life, and so I've chosen to insert a sermon here. But in the sermon, what I do is lay out some options that the people were faced with in the first century, and I think that people today are also faced with. And that is the reality of if someone is going to be released for the people— The people are going to choose the one to be freed who most embodies their ideals. And I think what you notice in the passion narrative itself is that the people um, are no longer interested in the kind of king that Jesus is portraying himself as and therefore do not see their hopes being fulfilled in this person. Instead, someone who is in prison in Rome as a result of his actions of insurrection and violent overthrow, or rather the attempt to violently overthrow the Romans, that is what has gripped the people's hearts. And the reason why I think it's fitting to insert this into the podcast now in lieu of our discussion on the principalities and powers is because the principalities and powers had gripped the people's hearts in the first century to put their confidence in a violent Um, militant insurrectionist as opposed to a peaceful, humble king named Jesus. And I think the church today is continually faced with the temptation to choose the ways of the principalities and powers over against the ways of the kingdom. And so I do give an example, which at the time, a year ago, of course, was practical and relevant. And I leave this up to you to determine if a similar thing is still relevant today in our own time. But I do believe that this sermon really gets at the heart of which leader's um, characteristics most faithfully embodies the type of characteristics that we are looking for in a leader. And I think both by the parade that Pilate embodies himself in as he enters Jerusalem in order to squelch any type of uprising by the people versus the kind of parade that Jesus enters in a very different fashion, I think gives us the opportunity to put ourselves in that place and ask, which parade are we wanting to be a part of? And I actually got these ideas and several of them, which I then ran with in my own way, but from Brian Zond and his book, Postcards from Babylon. And I want to make sure that you're aware that um, his thoughts have continually just given me rich, imaginative ways of picturing life in the Gospels. And I really appreciate um, Brian's ability to do that. He is also a pastor. And I've just found a lot of um, encouragement from his words. He's looking at realities and keeping the political scene of day-to-day life and idolatry that shows itself in um, nationalistic tendencies or praising one's country over against another country. And I believe he is spot on. And so this is a sermon. This episode uh, for this week is a sermon. I do intend to go on vacation next week. I'm not sure if I will have an episode for you. I guess we'll both find out when next Thursday comes and goes whether there's a new one. But for this week, I wish you an incredibly meaningful Holy Week and thought I would insert a sermon here to save myself a little bit of time and that I have several sermons to prepare for our church and want to be able to devote adequate time to that. And so I've decided to pull a sermon that I preached a year ago to to guide us in this week's um, understanding of 
of Holy Week. And then it'll tie that in a little bit, I think, with the continual temptation that the people of God face to choose the ways of the principalities and powers over against the ways of Jesus. And so without any more of an introduction, I simply offer to you, um, pick your parade. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ According to Mark. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish for me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, king of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. The gospel of the Lord. Jesus, we do bring praise and glory to you today and every day because you are worthy. 
Give us eyes to see and ears to hear you this morning as we compare and contrast these two varying, very differing passages of Scripture. We love you and we praise you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The two very differing passages of Scripture I'm referring to is the gospel reading that we had out here on the lawn versus the one that I just read to you a moment ago. And I'm very thankful for Palm Sunday and the way the lectionary sets up these readings for us to have our service in some sense split in half and to have two gospel readings, one where we all get to join the crowds and join the celebration of those proclaiming Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, And then once we gather around our space here to listen into what transpires just several days later with similar crowds stirred up because of the religious leaders to chant something far different about the one who just came in riding on a donkey a few days before. And so if you have a Bible and want to follow along this morning, I'm going to go back and forth between Mark chapter 11 and Mark chapter 15. Because I think there's a contrast here that I want you and I to grasp because I think it's really, really helpful to understand it. Jesus comes riding in on a donkey in Mark chapter 11 to these words. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The word Hosanna, which is actually stated twice in the passage, they actually chant that right before they say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, just means, please save us. Rescue us. We're in bondage. We're in imprisonment. We need you to set us free. That's what we are chanting when we say Hosanna to Jesus himself. And yet, as the narrative outline that I read for you, it's kind of a strange narrative. Jesus sends two of his followers. He says, go to find find this person who's going to give you a colt. If they ask you what you're doing with this donkey, just say the Lord needs it. He'll return it later. He'll let you do it. And Jesus sets up this really strange scenario where he wants to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. It actually says on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is basically like a baby donkey. So you could imagine Jesus, if you can picture the scene, is on an animal so small and so unassuming that Jesus' feet most likely are dragging on the ground while he's riding into the city. This does not typically appear to us to be the idea we would have in mind when it comes to a king entering into the city. Oftentimes, kings rode into the city as a display of strength, as a display of force, oftentimes with a military behind them to prove to everyone who happens to be looking, we are in charge, this is the strength that made us in charge, and you need to listen to what we say. Now, it's really interesting that when you jump into Mark chapter 15, we have Jesus confronted with this guy named Pilate. Pilate is the governor over Judea who doesn't live in Jerusalem. In fact, Pilate actually resides in Caesarea, which is west of Jerusalem. But every year at Passover, which is the time that we're celebrating here in the church calendar, it was the time they were celebrating there, you remember the Israelite story of salvation from the original Passover. They were enslaved to the Egyptians. They were being oppressed by the Egyptians. You can imagine the cry of the people's heart is, Help us, save us, rescue us, Hosanna. And what does the Lord do? He comes into Egypt and he rescues his people. He delivers them from certain oppression. In fact, every single Israelite from that point on, every year around Passover, is pleading with the Lord to rescue them again, to save them again, to remove from them oppressive forces. Well, The Roman Empire is one such oppressive force, and Caesar is no dummy. 
He knows the history of the Jewish people. He knows the tendency for insurrection and for violent overthrow of the authorities or the government to take place during Passover because all of the Jews' hopes and dreams are rooted in our God is going to come and save us. And so what does Caesar do? Well, he sends in his governor, Pilate, from Caesarea into Jerusalem in order to squelch any type of insurrection that might be happening at the hands of the Jews. Because goodness, if Rome loses control of the Jews, well, it's all over. So Rome sends Pilate, probably on a war horse of some kind, bearing a sword in his hand, with a military parade, to make sure that everybody knows Rome is here, you don't cross Rome. Oh, and by the way, just to placate the Jews, every year at this time, we'll, we'll be benevolent to you because we're, we're good rulers, us Romans. We will grant to you the release of one of your prisoners. One person that we have imprisoned, you might think unjustly, it doesn't really matter. We will release one of them for you as a, as a measure of goodwill to keep the peace because we don't want to riot. What does Pilate do? He brings forth a prisoner. We're told in Matthew, I'm sorry, in Mark um, 15, that there was a man called Barabbas who was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. Now that's a lot of information, but it tells us exactly what we need to know. Barabbas was a person who said during this time, when the Lord comes to overthrow his enemies, the way it's gonna happen is through violence, through aggression, through a display of force, and through death if necessary. I mean, the word insurrection just literally means, um, oh, I lost it. Oh, there it is. A violent uprising against an authority or government. That's what it means. And Barabbas is in prison as a result of this. But here's Jesus, who's coming in in Mark chapter 11, being hailed as the king holding a bunch of palm branches by the people that are chanting his name. And I want you to see why it is that Jesus does what he does. He actually fulfills something that Zechariah chapter 9 told us was going to happen. Let me read it for you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he. Now, again, it's kind of up to the imagination, right, to to decide what does triumphant and victorious mean as it applies to a king. Victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay, there we go. There's There's the fulfillment of what this person is going to do. But the passage goes on. He will take away the chariot from Ephraim, and the war horse from Jerusalem. The weapons of war will be broken, and he will teach peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, my guess is that Barabbas and several other members of the Jewish nation did not read too closely in Zechariah 9 because their goals and ambitions with respect to their oppressive Roman rulers was all about war. The way to overthrow oppressive enemies is to be stronger yourself, is to rally around you those who can fight the battle that you can't. And it is a call to arms And it is a call to war. And yet Jesus claims to be Israel's long-awaited king. The ruler, the descendant of David, blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Well, David, I mean, David killed Goliath. He's strong and powerful and mighty. But David was also humble and broken and a man after God's own heart. Which version of David is going to come as the reigning king. I'll tell you which version of David I'd like to come. I'll tell you which version of David sometimes I find myself rallying around, and it isn't always the one embodied by Jesus. 
And so we have a contrast, and I want you to see it closely. Pilate enters Jerusalem from the west, from Caesarea, riding on a war horse, complete with a military parade and soldiers carrying swords. Jesus enters Jerusalem from the east, from Jericho, riding on a donkey in a parade of his own. We embodied that this morning. But the only weapons his people have in their hands are palm branches. Do you see the disconnect? Pilate stands up and he asks the people, who's your guy? Who's your king? Who do you want to follow? Who do you want to lead you? Jesus or Barabbas? And our narrative spells out exactly where the hearts of the people lie. They want Barabbas. He's someone who embodies their ideals. He's someone who's not afraid of Rome. He's someone who's willing to be thrown into prison because God's righteous cause is greater than the authority's threat to him if he doesn't back down. We know this as we're reading it. As, well, of course Jesus has to be the one to be sacrificed because he's got to save us from our sins. Right, but step into the narrative for a minute. Step into the narrative and ask yourself, which one of these two ways brings about God's ends? Let me see if for just a second I can help make this relevant. I've debated all week as to whether I was going to speak names when I say what I'm about to say or whether I'm just going to speak in generalities. I'm deciding at this moment that I'm going to speak in generalities. We have a lot of tension right now in our culture. Turn on the news. There's a lot of tension. Christians get caught up in the tension just as much as everybody else, sadly. And sometimes Christians getting caught up in the political or the partisan distinctions and intensities tend to think that their role as Christians aligns itself with the roles of those in the culture. And I came across an article a week and a half ago following those, it's from a, a strongly conservative Christian, but who has a fairly wide voice and readership, who is still upset regarding what he perceives to be a stolen election in the 2020 election. Believes that Trump won by a landslide, should still be the president of the United States. And his call was the government is overimposing their bounds on the American people. We are losing our nation. It is time for Christians to realize we need to start taking up arms because there very well could become a civil war and we need to be prepared to fight it. I'm not going to tell you which person it appears to me that this man is following, Barabbas or Jesus. I'm going to leave that up to you. But I would like to submit to you that in our own lives, we tend, I do, and I I would highly imagine it's similar for some of you, we like the show of strength. We like the display of powering up, whether that means we're about ready to confront somebody and we have to bring all of our best arguments before we do to prove that our point is right and it's indefensible. Or it's, it's, you, can't, you can't reject it, not indefensible. That'd be a terrible way to have an argument, right? You think you're right. That's the way you argue with somebody. We love verbal violence, as a good friend of mine puts it. We might not draw a sword or hold, pull a gun, but we like to tell people what we think and we use um, overly aggressive language to do it. And I want you to notice we're following a king who brought in a kingdom where the weapons he brought or palm branches. That kingdom was brought in this way, and that kingdom will be sustained and will grow in this way only. It is a kingdom of peace 
where we do not learn the ways of war, we do not learn the ways of aggression, and as Jesus' followers, we are not in a position of constant defensiveness, wondering what the culture around us is going to do to move and to infringe upon our rights. As Christians, we don't have rights. We've given all of those up to follow Jesus. And to faithfully follow Jesus is to continue to faithfully proclaim the truth of who he is and who he was no matter what authorities do to infringe upon us. The beautiful story about what Jesus is doing is that his very life, his silence and humility and calmness in Pilate's presence did not stop the kingdom of God from coming. Pilate's aggression, Pilate turning him over, Jesus being put to death, not only didn't prevent the kingdom from coming, it brought the kingdom. And what this is a call for you and for me to realize is that we are in a position of strength, but strength defined as Jesus defines it. As the one who, re who rests in the Lord to provide for him what he needs. Jessica read it from Psalm chapter 50, and I don't even have it up here with me. He was trusting in the Lord. The Lord was the one who was going to rescue him. The Lord was the one that was going to save him. He did not leave that up to him, and he does not leave that up to us. You know, I've had several of you come to me in the last several weeks and say, I really like what you're doing. I like that 30,000-foot view of Genesis, but man, bring it down to the ground. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? You're telling me I can't judge other people. That's taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How do I live based on what you're telling me? Let me give it to you straight. I have found it next to impossible, and I'm not sure I've ever met a human who can do both loving their neighbor and judging their neighbor at the same time. When you do one, you do not do the other. We are not free to properly love our neighbors as ourselves. We are not free to properly love our enemies and to pray for the forgiveness of those who persecute us while we are simultaneously judging them. And so the point of looking at Genesis 3 is to say we need to first relinquish our supposed right to judge other people or to assume that our ways of aggression, like a Barabbas, are the way to get God's will done. I think it's a call to repent of that and to receive the life and love and humility and self-sacrifice of Jesus such that he transforms us and enables us to remain calm, peaceful, and loving in the midst of some incredibly tumultuous times, knowing that our king defeated everything, death included, in order to grant us a position in his kingdom. We don't have to defend that. That is ours by right. We now, from that place of victory that Jesus earned for us, are free to love our neighbors without judgment because that's what Jesus did for us. I'm not sure I know of too many contrasts that are greater than this. And the question I would pose for you this morning is, which parade are you marching in? Which parade has captured your heart? Which parade do you believe God would be interested in if God himself were to come and to bring pure righteousness and justice to the world? I have this nagging suspicion that we all know the right answer but sometimes deeply in our hearts and minds, we sort of hope and wish for one day, you're really going to get what's coming to you. That's what Jesus wants to root out. Not because it's not good and right to love justice, but because we're terrible people to execute that justice. We need to be cleansed and renewed by Jesus' idea of what it means to be king. And then, yes, we will one day reign with him we will one day rule with him like this, not like that. This is the call to the church for us to learn our freedom, to follow in Jesus' footsteps, to love what he has done and to love who he is. And for some of us deep down inside, we need to repent of the fact that when we look at Jesus embodying this, we don't actually love what we see. 
I would much rather people be honest with themselves and honest with the group and admit that and work through that than imagine we can live out an aggressive, take up arms, Christian mentality and think we're doing God's will. I'm not sure you could argue that from the New Testament. I'm just gonna toss that out there. But I want you to decide. This is your walk of faith between you and Jesus to know what he is calling you to. And I believe he's calling his church to embody him in the way that we live and in the way that we love. And that, I'm afraid, can only be done when we trust the Lord God himself to bring in his kingdom in his way and in his time. He's shown us his way. Jesus showed us. And he's inviting us in to that same way of life. Jesus, we need you. We need you all over the place. I, I don't know how many areas in each of our lives this affects us, but I do know that for each of us who wants to love our families, wants to love our neighbors, wants to love people um, from Christ Church or from Grace Lutheran and love now members of the same church, we need to shed judgment. We need to shed ways of aggression or believing we need to power up to defend ourselves or whatever um, plagues us deep within our own hearts. Jesus, I pray that you would completely revolutionize the way your church views itself, how we view ourselves, how we view each other, and how we view the world. Would you reorient our hearts and minds around you as a rider on a donkey with the weapons of palm branches bringing a gospel of peace. Would you teach us what it means to lay down violence and aggression in your name and ask your spirit to give us a, an imagination capable of seeing and believing that you can bring about better ends when we follow Jesus than we could ever bring about by following Barabbas. Thank you for willingly sacrificing yourself for us. Thank you for willingly heading straight into what we now call Holy Week, but for you, it was certainly Hell Week. Thank you for facing it head on so that we could find life on the other side of the grave with you. We love you and we praise you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.